Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcelo. I uh, work for Bookwire in Brazil. As Jose already said, I started to work in Bookwire in 2012. And since then, in Brazil, we are, we are able to uh, become leaders in the, in the market in terms of being the most important uh, digital aggregator there. I'm happy to be, to be with you this morning, especially with such an interesting theme, which is Rethink Brazil. I learned from Jose that Brazil is the first country to be repeated in the, in the Read Imagine since it started, so it's, it's a responsibility to re Rethink Brazil. Uh, but I, I also would like to first say thank you to Read Imagines, thank you to Jose and to, and to Luis for such a kind invitation. Obrigado, muchas gracias. So, Brazil. If I am successful today, I will present some macro environment factors of the country to bring some context. Uh, I, will, I will talk briefly about the printed publishing market. Uh, then I will focus a little bit more on the digital publishing market in Brazil. And talk about some initiatives that uh, I think are how Brazil is rethinking Brazil in the digital market. So, uh, Belinja. Uh, this is uh, a term that was created in 1990s from an uh, uh, economist in Brazil called Elmar Bacha. And he created this term to explain the extreme difference that we have in Brazil. I know that every country has its nuances, but in Brazil, we have a very uh, extreme situations and scenarios, uh, economically speaking. And the Marbasha created this term because it's, it facilitates the explanation of how, how can we see Brazil to foreigners that don't understand the complex of the country. So uh, he uh, discovered that we had, depending on the angle that we viewed the, that we viewed the country, have index that would compare to a, a European country, an index that would compare to an underdeveloped country. It's not meaning to be disrespectful, it's just a term that facilitates the comprehension. So, uh, going to the bad numbers. Uh, Brazil has uh, a Gini index, which measures the inequality uh, of 0.52. It's in improving. 50 years ago, we are uh, 0 0.64. 0 uh, but still, we are in the top 20 worst countries in the world in terms of inequality. Uh, 20 million people in Brazil is at risk of famine and starvation. And this is even worse when we realize that this category if in the UN classification says that these 20 million people are experiencing physical pain of the lack of food. The Human Development Index is places the Brazil in 84th position among all the countries. The Education Developed Index places Brazil in the 79th position. This is a real, real bottleneck for any kind of growth. Uh, and uh, 39 million people without proper sewage system, which is 18% of the population. So this is the bad side. Let's go to the good side. Uh, we just came, came back to the top 10 economies of the world last year. We are now uh, in 23, the ninth economy of the world. Uh, uh, we are in a very uh, strategic position of being food provider. We are number one in coffee production. Around 45% of the coffee production in the world comes from Brazil. Soybean producer is 54%. Uh, we are by far number one in beef and chicken meat produce, production export. And uh, top five in oil production export. Uh, not only commodities goods, but also some aggregated value, like th number three in commercial military aircraft manufacturing. So depending on the angle that we see Brazil, we, uh, we have different, different results. But what stands out is the uh, severe uh, inequality gap, social gap, economic gap, and educational gap that we have uh, in the country. So, uh, uh, but now I will talk about what, is, what maybe is ahead. We are kind of living a new uh, good momentum, economic speaking, and for that I explain that I'm not too optimistic. I use the words of a Brazilian author called Ariano Suassuna that says, the optimist is a fool, the pessimist is a bore, really good is to be a hopeful realist. So it's hopeful realist eyes that I will present some numbers 
that will kind of indicate uh, what lies ahead in terms of economic growth for Brazil. And being a little bit more poetic in Spanish, el optimista es un tonto, el pessimista es un aburrido, es bueno ser un realista esperanzado. Realista esperanzado sounds better than hopeful realist. Uh, so, some uh, very quick uh, indications of, of a new good moment cycle of economy that will uh, happen in Brazil, probably. This illustration is, was used by the, as a cover of The Economist magazine in 2009. I'm not comparing the moments. At that moment, it was, uh, was much more powerful in terms of growth. But we can see that uh, with some convergence of forces, we will probably serve uh, better, better days in, in 2005 and ahead. Number one is the economy. We are, uh, I told you that we come back to the 10, we are nine economy, in 24 we are already the eighth economy, we need to, to expect the end of the year to consolidate that, but the numbers will show that. And probably by 29, 20, 23rd, the sixth or even the fifth economy if we pass UK in terms of size of the economy. Uh, inflation, it's super interesting to see the presentation for the European numbers, to see how Europeans now is considering inflation. <laughs> it's, even, it's even funny for a Brazilian perspective, because of course we have to deflate, we have to, 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 to evaluate the impact, the impact of an inflation in the numbers. But different from the rest of the world, or major part of the world, Brazil is in control. Uh, I remember the times that, uh, when I was a kid in Brazil, that uh, we had 80% of monthly inflation. Uh, my father would receive the salary, we have to go to the supermarket on the first day of the salary, because otherwise we would only buy one-fifth of the food that we need at the end of the month. But now it's in control, uh, since pandemic, uh, and consistently decreasing. Uh, we are probably in 24, from 3 to 4%, or even less. Another sign of growth is Brazil is beating records in trade balance export and import since 2014 compared to Latin America countries. And in 23 and 24 are very high numbers of uh, good and positive trade balance and records. Uh, consumer confidence index uh, is an important uh, metric and it's never uh, like this before. It's a super optimistic view of the future uh, uh, considering this consumer confidence index. Brazil has 2.2 cell phones by user, which is also a good metric of the economic, but also good for us in the publishing market, because for 54% of the people who read digital books, they read on the cell phones. Uh, another force, another sign of growth, is that Brazil can be the first net zero, uh, uh, net zero economy and, keep, and can be a, a green leader. Just one minute. Uh, that's because uh, uh, Brazil, for instance, has a renewable power matrix in energy of 85%. If compared to the rest of the world, the world depends on 26% of renewable, for, renewable energy uh, sources. 75% uh, of Brazil car fleet has already adopted uh, biofuel. And because of the because of the, how, we, how we handle now the, for uh, reforestation after some dark times in the last years, but now we are back to monitoring the reforestation. And, and as I said before, the strategic position of food as food provider, we can be really uh, what they call a, 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 a very important sink of decarbonization and becoming the net zero economy in the world and be a leader in that. This seems paradox with the with I just said, but Brazil has been found new oil reserves that put us and, and probably will put us in some years as a number three uh, producer in oil production and in exporter in the world. Uh, it's technology that is ultra deep water uh, extraction of oil. It's a cleaner oil, and uh, it's going to be important for the transition to a net zero economy, even though it seems like a paradox. But it's also another thing, another sign of very, as a growth pillar for 2005 and ahead. And finally, uh, uh, from the economic point of view, investment uh, rating agencies are again 
probably in two or three years, uh, applying the Brazil to investment grade, which means more money flow, uh, more investments, and a richer situation. Uh, okay, now uh, after the context, so we have uh, a very complex country uh, uh, with, with different uh, scenarios, that, depending on how, that we, on how we do the cut of the, of the statistics. We have, uh, which seems to be a good momentum, not being too optimistic, only being a hopeful realist. Uh, but the, uh, the news about the uh, publishing market is not so good. And this is only printed books, okay? Uh, we can see that uh, we have a curve detached from the GDP when, com when we compare the growth of GDP to the market sales. The green line is, is going down. And when we apply inflation, and we must do that, because in a period like almost 20 years, the impact of inflation is, is pretty significant, uh, we have a market that decreases 40% uh, until 22 if you compare from 26, which is the base year. We had a market of around 10 billion Brazilian reais, and now we have a market of the size of 6 billion Brazilian reais. Uh, uh, and probably when, when, the, when, the, when the 23 results will come out, probably in the next 15 days, and will be added to the historic series, we will see that the decrease will be around 43% in these in this years. It's a tragic, tragic information, it's very bad information. On the other hand, uh, and now we start to, do, to, to, to present some numbers about the digital market, digital market is behaving quite the opposite. Uh, we can see here that uh, this only production in 23, 83% uh, of the production is in e-books, 17% in audio, and, and we, we are having probably what is the beginning of the audio, audiobook market in Brazil. Some people say that there's no market in audiobook, in, no audiobook market in Brazil. But we're having now a very good growth. Of course, the audiobook numbers are based on low numbers, so percentage will be high. Uh, but it means that uh, we are getting there. Uh, on October 23, Audible has released the Brazilian bookstore. So uh, numbers are starting to change. Uh, in 23, uh, the digital market in Brazil produced 14,000 14, titles. In terms of catalog, we, we, are, we, not, we now have 120,000 units, meaning that the whole catalog is 7% audiobooks and 93% uh, e-books. I forgot to say that this is a brand new number that was just released last week by the Brazilian Book Chamber and the Nielsen book data, so uh, very fresh numbers that we are now trying to understand. Uh, in terms of uh, sales, uh, 12 million units were sold, uh, being 3% in audio uh, and 97% in, in e-books. You can see the growing in audio sales is 6 3%, but again, it's always based on low numbers because the market is still beginning. In terms of revenue, uh, it's 1% it's audio, nine, still 9% e-books. You can see the huge number of, grow, of, of growth rate in audiobooks is 81%. When we, it's 9% in nominal terms, 81% after the inflation is, is applied. Uh, average price is something that is very, uh, uh, it's very difficult in Brazil. We have very low prices. We are recovering a little bit year by year. Uh, when inflation is applied, and overall, we are increasing prices, unit prices by 9%. 11% in audiobooks and 4% in e-books. Uh, so the market size of the digital book in Brazil, the digital publishing in Brazil is 3, 340 million Brazilian reais. And uh, different from the printed book, we grew 39% in terms of nominal numbers. And when we applied inflation, it's 33% and 23 compared to 22 
when what is most important is the, the, the growth compared to the GDP growth. So it shows a very good tendency in a, in a, in a good curve, different from the, what we saw in print book. Uh, printed book now compared to P-book is 8%, used to be 6 in 22. And uh, this is the historic series with, with new numbers, including 23 already, uh, different from the we saw in the printed book that in, from 26 to 22 decreased 43%. The Brazilian digital publishing market, real growth in, with inflation applied, it's 158% from 20, 2019 to 23, 2019 when the first survey of digital book was started to be done. <clears throat> so, uh, and uh, finally, this is the how how the uh, digital book is uh, digital content is 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 performing compared to P-book over the years since since 19. We can say that since 19 to 23, we doubled the market share. So, uh, again, uh, a very complex country uh, with different scenarios and different metrics, uh, uh, depending on how we cut the statistics, how we see the statistics, statistics a very good momentum uh, uh, that is happening uh, in the macroeconomic view, uh, not being responded by the printed book, as we saw, and I think it's super related to what Kudigur just said, printed book is not responding, but we have some initiatives that I would say that they are, uh, it's, we can say that already Brazil, we think in Brazil in terms of digital market book and trying to find new ways, and that's why you had this very significant increase that we saw in the last slide. Three verticals. Uh, first one is uh, business to government. Uh, in Brazil, we have a, a significant uh, participation of the government in the purchasing programs of books, and it's now becoming, uh, and, and they are now trying to uh, bring the digital content to it. Uh, not uh, still in the federal, uh, in the country uh, sphere, but uh, Bookwire has been participating in some states initiatives. Paraná State is one state in the south. Sao Paulo State is, uh, is the state in the southeast region. Sao Paulo is the most important one in terms of economics. If Sao Paulo, for instance, was, was a country, they would be, uh, Sao Paulo would be in the D20, D20 uh, forum. It would be the 19th economy of the world. Uh, and these initiatives are uh, kind of finding new ways and finding new access, bringing books to non-readers. How do we... What, what I'm calling this vertical, that is rethinking propositions. Because what we need to do is in, in, the, in the picture like that is not to consider the, the reader's market at the moment, which is around 30 million people, 30 to 40 million people in a country of 215 million people. So it's a tiny market comparing to the, the whole population. And we need to bring new readers. That's, that's how we solve maybe the inequality gap, the social gap, the economic gap, the educational gap, is bringing more people to the readers' market. And this is what these uh, kind of things are doing. Uh, we are creating new access and taking the books to people probably that would not have access to books or even e-books uh, at first place. So, uh, uh, it's interesting to see uh, the involvement and engagement of the kids in, the, in Paraná and Sao Paulo. They have, they have a monitor of the reading process. For these three initiatives, coincidentally, uh, we have partnered with Odilo, which is a Spanish company. Odilo is the knowledge behind it. Uh, Paraná and Sao Paulo programs are from students, K-12, mid-school. Uh, the Biblion is, is a library, an open digital library for citizens that live in Sao Paulo. Uh, so this, all programs in gov government are starting to, to uh, become significant in terms of revenue for the, for, the, for the publishers and creating new access, creating new readers, forming new readers and trying to, to change the scenario. Second vertical, uh, that seems to be a Brazilian thing, uh, which is what I call telco apps. And 
I just mentioned three of the most important companies that are working in, in, with this. It's EXA, it's a company that is uh, linked to Telecom Italia. Campsoft, that works, it's a small company that works with micro uh, telephone operators in the country. There are uh, hundreds of uh, micro companies that works telecom, telecom services. And Skilo is the most important one, is the one that kind of created the model, and uh, is dominant position, is the market share, is very interesting. And I will use Skilo as an example to try to explain the model and how it works. But Skilo is, Skilo Campsoft and Exa is delivering digital books to uh, telco users through data voice bundles. So if you have a plan, if you have a bundle, you receive a, a digital book, and you can use, and you can choose the book that is recommended by month, or you can even uh, change the book from a restricted uh, catalog that is offered by the telco, usually very popular books and best-selling ones. Uh, and what is interesting and important is they receive the books, and they can access the books whenever they want through their login and password to the bundle plan. Uh, and even if they cancel the service with the partner company, with the telecom operator, the, the book is still, still belongs to the, to the user. Numbers of Skilo and numbers of this model are pretty amazing, are, are incredibly uh, high. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's another league. It seems to be another game. Uh, Skilo had 14 million installs of the app, a lot of reviews. They report their consumption in terms of minutes, even, even for the e-book. So it's almost 2 billion consumed minutes in the last five years. Uh, they have a lot of monthly sessions, and in five years, was 10 billion e-books and audiobooks was distributed by, by Skilo to the, to the telco users. Some statistics of Skilo that also uh, exemplifies the model itself. Uh, the average engagement time is two, two hours and 19 minutes. Session time in 24 is 27 minutes. A very high satisfaction score. Uh, numbers are already told. And that's 88 million minutes that was consumed only from January until now. Uh, 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 it's, a, it's an incredible uh, amount of money of a new access mode that we could not see this kind of numbers in the regular channels. And now it's kind of happening again, trying to bring new readers to it. It's important to say that most of these bundles are prepaid bundles, the ones that we have to add credits as we go. So it's target to a not so privileged population. And the numbers on skills are amazing. Uh, in terms of, in terms of the, the app in the, in the Android, uh, they are the first one. Uh, 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 above, above Kindle and, and others. Apple, they are the third one. It, it happens the same with Exa. It happens the same with Campsoft. So, and finally, the, the third vertical that I think it's uh, rethinking uh, Brazil digital market is what we call virtual libraries. It's not rocket science. I know they have virtual libraries everywhere, and, and we work with global global brands in it, but there are some local initiatives that are doing a little bit differently. We have Pearson uh, Biblioteca Virtual, Pearson Virtual Library. It, uh, even though it's Pearson, but it's a, a Brazilian initiative that is uh, one of the, one of the uh, protagonists in, in, in that for the academic world. We have Minha Biblioteca, which is in Portuguese for my library, and uh, Arvore. Arvore de Libros, uh, three, of, three of books, if you have to translate. But we work with all of them. Bebot is a, is a kids, kid material life, uh, library, Odilo, I already told you. And, and Sina is a new library from the EXA company that is working with Telco, and, and, Telco, and it's, it's a target to micro-learning and very small uh, types of content. And we work off the... Well, also work with the international ones, Overdrive. Now, Catalogos is a Cengage new initiative in Brazil, too, for the academic world. In, uh, instead of explaining the model, I, dis I chose to use Arvory as an example of the model, 
And I'd like to show you a video, if it works. Uh, it's, please, it's a marketing-driven institutional video, but please ignore that part, just to understand the, the, the model uh, when it's presented by the user itself, the teachers and the kids that use the platform. A leitura, ela transforma não só o ambiente, mas as pessoas que estão nele. A Escola Concept pensa é, nessa parceria com a árvore em um momento em que a escola, principalmente aqui em São Paulo, ainda era muito nova. E houve um investimento de trazer cópias físicas de livros em inglês, em português. Mas sendo uma escola de vanguarda, sendo uma escola de inovação, é claro que a gente queria mais, né? entendendo que hoje o livro ele não é só físico, é um livro que também se coloca no mundo digital fez muito sentido a parceria com a árvore naquele momento. Quando nós iniciamos o nosso projeto de um Chromebook para aluno, nós começamos a olhar que é, parceiros poderiam contribuir para esse projeto digital. Né? E a árvore, então, conversa é, diretamente com a proposta. São muitos benefícios que eu enxergo na parceria é, com a árvore, né? a gama aí de livros disponíveis para trabalho em sala de aula e depois quando a gente olha para a atualidade, a curadoria por detrás ali das matérias selecionadas facilita primeiro o trabalho né, para os nossos professores e professoras de ter certeza que vai ser um, um texto seguro, uma fonte segura, né? isso enriquece muito o momento de sala de aula. Com o novo ensino médio e as matérias eletivas, eu pude ver na prática professores até de outras áreas do conhecimento, como ciências humanas, usando a árvore na sala. Com o uso da árvore, isso ficou potencializado no sentido de que eu não preciso necessariamente explorar toda a obra em si. Né? Eu posso explorar um trecho, um capítulo ou um aspecto que é presente na obra inteira, ou simplesmente eu só posso despertar o desejo da leitura do aluno pela obra em si. Eu lia menos, porque eu não, não tinha muito livro assim, e aí eu descobri né, que a árvore aqui, e aí eu conseguia ler todo dia. E depois da árvore, até na escola eu comecei a ler mais, porque antes era mais em casa mesmo que eu lia. Depois que surgiu a árvore, eu podia ler em qualquer lugar, eu não precisava carregar o um livro pesado para onde quer que eu fosse, era só ter o celular ou o tablet. Eu acho que teve muita mudança no dia a dia com a leitura, dos meus amigos principalmente, até porque na árvore a gente tem um negócio de indicação, e você pode indicar para o seu amigo o livro que você leu, e não tem a desculpa de tipo, ah, eu preciso comprar o livro, ele já está ali. Eu posso acompanhar inclusive a porcentagem, de leitura deles até aquele momento. Também estipular um prazo para que eles leiam esse livro e consigo, inclusive, fazer com que outras pessoas saibam. Eu posso indicar livros para outros colegas. O fato da árvore funcionar como uma tarefa que a gente consegue mandar para casa e tem tarefas complementares, prévias e posteriores, é, a árvore, ela meio que salva a minha vida. A potência e as possibilidades múltiplas do trabalho com a árvore, ela vai se revelando à medida em que você explora a plataforma. Então, trazer isso para o dia a dia da criança também é trabalhar competências importantes que elas vão levar para a vida. E a árvore, ela se adequa muito a esse propósito né, de uma escola inovadora, de uma escola que está atualizada e conectada com um mundo que não é só físico, mas que também é digital. Leitura transforma. Leitura transforma. Leitura transforma. So what is interesting is to uh, is to see that uh, it's a whole ecosystem that is delivered around the content, and uh, the video was was made in a very 
uh, high-level uh, schools in Sao Paulo. Uh, the concept school is a bilingual uh, English-Portuguese school. The Humboldt is German-Portuguese. But what is interesting in Arvore, in the other models, and I'm using Arvore as an example, uh, in the Arvore's case, they delivered the same technology, the same platform, the same content, the same uh, ecosystem, the same gamification, the same monitoring to 11,000 public schools in less leveraged uh, regions in Brazil. So when we talk about that, uh, the way that we need to rethink Brazil is to bring new readers to the game, is to bring new readers to be readers. And, and, and we see a very good economic momentum uh, happening. And, but the printed book is not responding to that demand. We, we need to say that uh, to overcome the social economic educational gap, you know, in, in a way we're able to add new readers to the market, and we need and we must consider the digital formats and what I call the new access mode as essential tools to make this happen. So. Uh, that that's was my presentation, and I just want to use my one minute, still, uh, to say something about uh, the way uh, in Brazil, uh, in Brazil we speak Portuguese, uh, the way uh, we say obrigado in Brazil, and to me, and just to explain a little bit, and it's not original from me, I'm copying a, I'm copying a professor, the dean of the Lisbon University, when he was talking at in an inaugural lecture in Universidade de Brasília. And it became a, a bit famous, and I'd like to kind of replicate it here. Because when I was talking to José uh, two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, he said, some, he, he said something that immediately came, brought this to my mind. He said, Marcelo, now you, after you speak at Readmagine, you will become ambassador of, of Readmagine. And this is a little bit uh, what I want to explain about Obrigado, because it just triggered the, the idea of explaining a little bit. So, which is, uh, and I, I have to refer to Tomás Aquinas in his works of Summa Theologica, uh, he kind of uh, teaches us that the gratitude levels are made of three levels. The superficial one, the intermediary one, and the deeper level. The superficial one is when we use the uh, Cognitive uh, intellectual uh, recognition. The second one, the, the intermediary one, when we are uh, a little more profound and goes to the emotion. And the, f the third one is the commitment, uh, uh, kind of the commitment, thankfulness that, that is, accordingly to Thomas Aquinas, is ha happens when we, are, when we are expressing appreciation. So, related to the languages, when we say uh, thank you, or thank you very much, or even dank, or vielen dank in, in English and in German, we are using the first level uh, of intellectual, the, the, the cerebral, the, the mental plane of being thankful. When uh, in most European language that's come from Latin, uh, we say, for instance, in merci, merci beaucoup, or, or muchas gracias in, in Spanish, or grazie, grazie mille in Italian, we are using the second level, which is a little bit, uh, also consists of intellectual recognition, but also is a little bit more profound in an emotional level. And uh, we have the Portuguese way of doing that, and probably is the only language in the world that uses the third level of thankfulness, which is the commitment level. Right? Uh, muito obrigado is, comes from obligatos. Ligatos is ob connection, obligacion. Uh, ob liaison, uh, and uh, it's a derivative of the word obligation. And I am obligated to you, I am bound to you, I am committed to a dialogue, I am committed to, this, to develop this dialogue on an ongoing basis. Thank you for your invitation, thank you for the attention, and because of that I am destined to contribute to the best of my ability to your projects and to your work. So this is the definition of ambassador. <laughs> Uh, and uh, <laughs> with, that, with that being said, muito obrigado, José, muito obrigado, Luiz, muito obrigado, Reed Imagine, muito obrigado to all of you.